other music room. Here's um, a 1902 Mason and Hamlin, and this one's in, uh, it's the only oak Mason and Hamlin I have. I did a little light on it. You can see really nice quarter sawn grain just everywhere on this thing. Shut the lid and see that it's just a feast of quarter sawn grain. They didn't spare a tree when they built this thing. It's just terrific. It's really, really great. Great grain on this. And this, this cabinet was a design that they came up with to um, probably produce it more economically than their higher grade cabinets in that um, the, the particular construction method, if you can see, here's, here's the vertical style of the uh, side panel. Here's the horizontal rail of the side panel. You can see they, they don't meet flush. And this is really important when you're producing cabinetry because you don't have to sand that flush. If you, try, if you were attempting to build this with a flush panel, as on the list and on the 93BF that has all flush panels, after you assembled these two pieces of wood, at each joint you would have to sand or scrape that so that it was perfectly flat, so that when you finished it, when you put the shiny varnish on it, you wouldn't get different reflections across that joint, which would indicate that you'd done faulty workmanship. So nothing wrong with this, but they, they, they considered a way to be able to put these panels together that they didn't require the, the perfect level of precision that the higher grade cabinetry did. But yet, unless I'd pointed this out to you, because I'm a cabinet maker, um, you wouldn't know that you know, there was anything, there's, there's nothing, there isn't anything wrong with it, but you wouldn't know that there was anything different about it. And so it's just one of the subtle ways. So all the large panels, the fallboard, the lower panel, the lower cover, all of these panels that otherwise would take an additional maybe hour of labor on this thing, they were able to simplify that production process and cut out uh, important, you know, a, a time consuming step on the finishing end of it. So they were able to, in addition, there's no veneer on this. Even this is a, this is a, you know, three eighth or quarter inch thick panel of quarter sawn oak and it's not veneered. That's just a solid piece of wood has the same grain on the other side going through. And here's the, here's the aside. Quarter sawn oak, in, in addition to having this very beautiful characteristic wild grain with the andulary rays running through it, uh, is the, by benefit of the cut of the lumber, it's the most stable cut, which means that a quarter inch thick panel of wood where Normally you'd have to worry about this thing turning into sort of a potato chip or, you know, really curling and warping. Because that's quarter sun, that's not an issue at all. This stays, this thin wood stays as flat as the day it was sawed and prepared. So they, they probably saved a couple dollars on the construction of the cabinet on this. They added a little bit of, um, little tiny bits of carving here and there, like this, um, this thing. I don't know what you call that. It's kind of unidentifiable. It's almost like a butterfly. A little weird. It's something between a flower and a butterfly. They added that little bit of carving and they did a tiny bit of carving around the, the base of the column that's supporting the keyboard. So that's just a little bit of incised work. The other ornamentation on this is all done by, you know, machine. Because there's the that railroad track kind of molding on the bracket there. There's the turned stock with some beads and, and plain areas in it that was just bought by the foot from a factory. And they used that everywhere. They used it on the rests, uh, the candle rails. They used it up and down the corners of the case, both front and back in different formats. Of course, the, the same finished back that you expect on a chapel style case. And what was missing on mine when I got it, unfortunately, this piece of wood up here used to be one of those turned things um, that was gone. So I do plan on putting this piece of oak dowel in my lathe 
and attempting to come close enough to duplicate that. Uh, this one has the little music stand, has the lamp setting areas with the guardrail in front. These are just not glued in because I'm still working a little bit on the finish and it's a little more convenient to have these out than not. Than not. Um, looking at the interior, not the greatest view, but oh, anyway, there's the sub base box down on the base end. There's the box Humana with the turbine and the, the fan. And if we had a little more light, you will see it a little bit better. But anyway, this one's been completely, completely restored. Still doing the last little finishing details. Uh, last Saturday, this is Sunday, so it's been it's been all tuned. This is the the minimal normal harmonium specification that you could uh, have and still be a normal harmonium. So it has uh, two and a half sets of reeds plus another two half sets of the neolian and the sub bass and the straight upward octave coupler. So this one has a very bright and nice clear sound. So there's with flute and melodia. Um, additionally has a very bright Seraphone in the treble has a Vox Celeste. It has the muted Melodia Dolce. Which I love. It's a very necessary thing sometimes for some playing. And it has a terrifically good Aeolian. has the booming sub bass so you may have heard this on the couple videos that I've recorded um, really pleased with how this turned out it's just an exceptional organ and for one that cost only two hundred dollars such a bargain Anyway, okay, that concludes the tour, except for one other last thing, and that's this. <laughs> um, you know, it's the kind of thing that if you're into reed organs, you hear about these and you think, well, obviously that's never going to happen to me because, um, you know, this isn't the thing that ordinary <laughs> reed organ collectors ever get. This is like... <sighs> I don't know, this is like finding a five carat diamond on the sidewalk or something to have stumbled into one of these. Um, I was approached last year by a guy who's a collector who I had done some work for in the past and he said, well, I really want my, um, I want you to do the bellows on my little Roosevelt pipe organ. He has this little Roosevelt that was designed by um, Charles Haskell and Hilborn Roosevelt in the 1880s and it's a little portable pipe organ. It's the size of a you know a medium-sized upright piano yet it has uh, two ranks of pipes in it. Um, it has a diapason available at 8 and 4 and it has the flute stop available at 16, 8 and 4. So it's a unified tracker and he said, I need this thing re-leathered and if, do the mechanical, other mechanical issues and help put the case back together and the, in trade, I will give you my vocalion. And I had known of this vocalion for, since, I don't know, for at least 10 years 
when I, since I've known this gentleman, and um, I thought about it and thought about it. I said, my my inner thought was, this is extremely impractical. Where am I going to put this thing? Because it's um, you know it's eight feet wide, nine feet tall, or eight and a half feet tall, and it's uh, the case. <laughs> this case on this thing is is just this main part of the case is 42, 43 inches deep. So it doesn't fit in any house door. Then when you, of course, you put the bench and the pedals on it, it's, you know, it takes up uh, six by eight feet of floor. And it's like, where am I gonna put this? It's just, it's massive. You see, there's, you know, there's five octave keyboards, right? So there, that's three feet wide. Then when you see how wide the rest of the case is, like, oh my gosh, the keyboards are just dwarfed by the size of this case and it still hasn't filled the frame of the picture yet but it's the most beautiful thing it really is um, it needed a lot of reed work it had a lot of broken missing reeds so I had to, had to recreate reeds for it um, and it's this is just the most amazing thing to have it has um, has four complete sets of reeds on each manual it's um, you can register it to, you know, solo on either manual. Very nice. Um, I put a remote blower in it for it. Um, Use a pretty, pretty good size blower. The nice thing about it was that the previous owner, in when he got it in 1991, he being a pipe organ person, he had re-leathered the bellows on it, and including the pumping bellows. So this. As I got it, you know, it was it was hand pumped or off of a blower, and so I didn't have to do that uh, work for the winding of it, which would have been uh, impossible. Um, the amount of leather in these the reservoir it's a double rise reservoir. It's all leather and wood, um, just huge amount of leather on this thing. I think I think the bellows on this are probably adequate for about six ranks of pipes. It's huge. The, the bellows takes up the entirety of the base of this, this organ. Um, so there's eight, eight sets of manual reeds. It's really nice. It, on the swell, there's 16, 8, 8, and 4. On the grate, there's 8, 8, 8, and 4. And the forefoot on the grate is an extremely bright and loud uh, harmonic flute. The voicing on this is phenomenal um, it, it it's um, if you know anything about a vocalion it they kind of really blurred the line of what was possible with a reed organ in terms of making it just about a perfect imitation of a pipe organ and it really is and this being an early one from 1890 1891 um, it was completed January of 1891 and it's serial number 721 they built around 4,000 vocalions. Quite a number of them, at least half of that number, were uh, single manual, I believe, because there's a lot of single manual vocalions out there. Fewer two manual, and of course, the three manual vocalion is just exceedingly rare. I don't think we, I think we, we know of two three manual vocalions. The one in Italy, which is just uh, that would rival just about any small pipe organ that has 27 stops. So this only has nine stops, but it's still for a house. This is far more than I ever expected to have or ever need. Um, I still have the locking, still have a key for it, so you can you never know which way to turn this key. So there we go, that locks and doesn't have the pipe facade, but it has the gothic style case, which to me, I uh, can't be happier with that um, because it's just not trying to look like a fake pipe organ. It's trying to look like an exquisite piece of furniture, all in quarter sawn oak. So anyway, me the fortunate one who can't play pedals now has <laughs> uh, just a remarkably great uh, mini pipe organ thing sitting here. And it's built into the house. Believe me, it uh, came in in pieces. It's going to have to go out in pieces because it won't fit through the door. It won't fit through the door of the room that it's in, and it won't fit through the front door until it's uh, taken back apart again. So anyway, that's the tour of my collection. Um, 
It's one other organ that I have. Um, it's in a remote location. So someday I hope to bring it back home, do some more work on it, and get some recordings done on it because it's very interesting. Uh, 1866, two manual Mason and Hamlin. Um, kind of a thing that you don't encounter very often. Um, but probably more on that later. And for now, uh, thanks for watching through this um, really uh, marathon session of me yakking away. All right, later.